So my name is Ian Urbina. I've been a journalist for the last three decades, um, most of that time at the New York Times. I'm an investigative reporter, and through my career, I've largely focused on um, human rights, labor, and environmental crimes. And the last five years has been largely focused on a series called The Outlaw Ocean, which is about lawlessness at sea around the world. So The Outlaw Ocean uh, is an exploration journalistically, anthropologically, if you will, of this realm. And that realm is the sort of watery expanse that happens to cover two thirds of the planet. And historically, we've thought of that space as sort of this vacant void, different shades of blue that we fly over. Most of us just fly over it or we visit on the shores at the beach in the summer. Um, but what I wanted to do with the series was um, reimagine that space and put a focus on quite especially the people that work out there um, at sea. There are about 56 million people who work offshore. And I want to just look at the diaspora transient tribe of people that traverse that space, what their life is like, what their language is like, what their experience is like, indeed even what quite especially crime looks like, what their rules and etiquette are like. I wanted to, in the realm of crime, really kind of diversify people's understanding of the things that happen, the crazy things, the bad things, the heroic things that happen out there um, beyond just the standard, oh, Somali piracy and the BP spill, which are the two big references that people tend to have. And, and that reporting, I'll say, began about six years ago, ran for two years in the New York Times, and then I took a two-year leave, and a photographer and I went out for two more years to see, uh, to write a book, and then out of the book came the music project. You know, I've been a fan of hip hop my whole life, and have been, and um, uh, really moved by what Lynn manuel Miranda did with Hamilton. I thought he did a great service to rap in the sense that he took rap uh, into a new space. Initially, my thought was, well, I've got this book, it's called The Outlaw Ocean. It's, it's about this realm, you know, this, this otherworldly place. And it's rich in characters and narrative and tension and kind of thick description, detailed description of a very exotic place. It seems like as a body of intellectual property, it could really work well um, if handed over to a musician. And they would have lots of space if, if they're given the trust and freedom to choose things within that universe, within that book that most move them. So I began talking with electronic artists about this idea of interpreting the book and using sounds from the reporting to make music in their own style. And it clicked. And all of a sudden, it was from three musicians to five, from five to 50. And now we have over 400 musicians from 90 different countries and from every genre, including now hip hop, but also classical music and electronic. And it just sort of blossomed into this massive sprawling thing. But it all started with an initial batch of, you know, 10 electronic artists, you know, from around the world, Germany and Amsterdam and LA and New York, who, who thought the idea was neat and they were willing to try. And the music project was an experiment in alternate forms of storytelling, uh, sort of an experiment in translation, where we were taking written stories and translating them into music with help from musicians. Um, it was also an experiment in other ways, uh, in alternate ways of trying to finance and fund this very expensive type of journalism. So it was um, an experiment to see if we could build a model in which we could scale it up to a huge degree and involve musicians from lots of different countries and lots of different genres in a collaborative sort of way where we were all building off of each other's creativity and momentum and online traffic. So when I pitch the artist, I, I describe two ways in which I'm hoping the musician will connect with the book. A top-down way and a bottom-up way. The top-down way is I want them to engage with the book 
read all of it, read some of it, um, whatever they can and want to do, but engage with it on a top-down sort of emotional way. So, hey, you musician, take a look at this book, find stuff in it that really moves you, grabs you, really focus on the emotion of it all, and then start thinking about what does a song sound like that corresponds with that emotion. To some degree, it's akin to scoring a scene in a movie, right? This is a soundtrack for a book in much the same way that a soundtrack for a movie is meant to provide music that amplifies the emotion of that scene. That's the top-down relationship. The bottom-up relationship is one that is born of this archive of sounds, which essentially took the five years of reporting, video footage of the reporting, and looked for really rich sound. Now, the rich sound can either be ambient or it can be prose. So the ambient sounds are things like that have texture, that have beat to them. So think about machine gun fire in Somalia or chanting Cambodian deckhands on the South China Sea. These are things that have their own rhythm to them and they're rich, interesting sounds that grab you. You don't have to use any of the ingredients. You can use a lot of them. You can use them and slice them up in ways in which they're no longer even understandable, uh, almost like you would a music making a new musical instrument. Or you can use them wholesale in the in the lead into a song or the exit from a song or the denouement, the high point of a song. However you want to use them, use these various ingredients and make the music. And so that's what I offer and invite them to do. So to get into a little bit about why I was excited to be on board with this project, um, I'd never heard anything like it before. Such a unique idea to merge these live journalism and ambient aspects and then take that and combine it with artists like myself. Me specifically, I feel like I create very emotive, deep pieces that inspire imagery. So when you put those things together, I get to really use my creativity uninhibited. It's a, a, a beautiful relationship where the music gets to speak and the book speaks and, and you just get this really complete image. Once I decided to jump on board, um, of course I had to pick a chapter that I wanted to do my piece on, my EP. I'm a pretty positive person so I didn't want anything with like a super sad, deep, you know, ending where it just like, you know, things just didn't quite work out. But as I was scrolling through it, I found my chapter, um, which is the name for the EP, The Next Frontier. So I went through it and I found it and it was just about this, these efforts from the Greenpeace movement. And so I was super, super excited because I felt connected to this. It was like my first opportunity at um, this sort of musical activism. This is central to our lives. One of the things with this project I wanted to do was um, think about getting at a different demographic of people and also getting at people in general in a different way. And so a lot of folks, my son included, are learning about issues through an alternate way, say, such as comedy, right? Such as on YouTube. Um, or they're learning about places and people and things through alternate platforms like Spotify, right? Or Pandora or Amazon Music or whatever, music platforms. And granted, they're not getting full structured 3000 word New Yorker stories, but they are getting dabblings of things and places that then send them down a path to learn about what was that rapper or that you know, classical musician referring to when they, and then off they go. I think if journalism of the type that I was doing at the New York Times is going to survive, then we need to really be thinking more about how to get at those very audiences, like my son, and where are they already? Go to their watering holes, not, don't just try to invite them to our watering hole, figure out where their watering holes are and bring information to them in the form that they might consume it. If the experiment goes right, then they go off looking for more about that, either 
in your song or through other means, but now they're curious to know what, what is that referring to? If you take on the assumption that most people are curious and a lot of that curiosity is channeled on the internet, and if you lay the breadcrumbs for a short path between the journalism and the other thing that you're giving them, in this case music, if it's not a long path, then most likely they'll follow the breadcrumbs back.